Hello, I'm Sam Kriegman, and in this video, I'll be presenting our RoboSoft 2020 conference paper on scalable sim to real transfer of soft robots. And designing systems in simulation instead of reality has a number of benefits because building and testing even a single real robot can be very expensive time-consuming and dangerous for any humans in the vicinity. Testing a new control policy or even a single action can also be hazardous for the robot itself. Consider a robot on the edge of a cliff. If the robot can predict the sensory repercussions of stepping off the cliff, it can discard that action and rapidly cycle through millions of other options. 99% of which might result in the robot falling to its death, but the robot doesn't have to take those steps in reality. It can let its hypotheses die in its stead, as Karl Popper once put it. And eventually, better options will emerge, such as those which let the robot very carefully turn around to continue its mission. Our ability to faithfully simulate the behavior of a real robot is known as the simulation reality gap, or simply the reality gap. For rigid body robots, that reality gap is steadily closing. Computational models of rigid body dynamics can now be regularized and tuned so that control policies optimized in simulation are just as successful when tested on the physical system. Let's take a brief detour all the way back to the birth of sim to real research. In the 1990s, Nick Jacobi at the University of Sussex was performing some of the very first evolutionary robotics experiments. Jacobi was interested in rapidly optimizing control policies in very simple simulations, and then transferring those optimized policies to a physical robot. Jacobi coined the term the reality gap in reference to the fact that evolution tends to create controllers that exploit details of the simulation. If those details don't exist in reality, the controller fails to cross the reality gap. Jacobi was also one of the first, if not the first, to systematize the idea of adding noise to a simulator, which, if done in the right way, forces evolution to create more robust controllers, which are more likely to successfully transfer to reality. This idea has been rediscovered multiple times over the intervening years under the monikers of domain randomization or dynamics randomization. In the year 2000, rigid-bodied robot designs that were discovered in simulation were 3D printed by Lipson and Pollock. Once the motors were snapped into the printed bodies, they successfully exhibited the behavior that was generated in simulation. Later, others printed the entire robot, including the motors, so that it literally walked, or at least shuffled, out of the printer. There's a large and growing body of literature on transferring rigid bodied robots and or their control policies to reality. But what about sim to real for soft robots? Soft bodies are more challenging to accurately simulate, design, and precisely control. There are higher degrees of freedom and lower mechanical impedance can cause really funky, nonlinear, lagged behaviors in which the robot's body can even fold over onto itself, changing its boundary conditions. You'll never be able to simulate that, roboticists often claim. But soft robots are also more permissive to simulation inaccuracies. They're more permissive to design flaws and control precision, or lack thereof. A soft gripper or foot will passively conform to complex objects and terrain. This reduces the burden on the simulator to perfectly capture any single true surface contact geometry. Thus, the very thing that makes soft bodies difficult to simulate may make their sim to real transfer easier, not harder. The first sim to real transfer of soft robot design happened inside of a pressure and vacuum chamber using opened and closed cell foam rubbers. 
the latter of which will change in volume with pressure changes thus producing actuation. More recently, we demonstrated that soft robot designs discovered in simulation can be transferred to living tissues, here frog heart and skin cells, rather than silicone and other synthetic materials. This is great, but what if you want to build uh, macroscale robots that operate outside of a vacuum or soft robots that don't require biological or microsurgery expertise? In this previous work shown here, we demonstrated sim to real transferal of shape change, but not function. The physical system could deform its resting structure as dictated by an AI-generated strategy, but it could not locomote. The physical robot was heavy, it had high friction feet, and was symmetrically actuated in phase, so it just oscillated in place. To determine the particular challenges and opportunities of soft robot transferal, it would be useful to greatly scale up the number of design policy pairs transferred. To this end, we present a soft robot design and construction kit based on the silicon voxel modules used in our RSS paper, but miniaturized to increase their stability, simplified to improve reproducibility, and arbitrarily actuated to permit the transferal of locomotion. Most sim to real experiments start by sending a single robot design across the reality gap. Then they attempt to learn transferable control policies for this one presupposed body. 20 years ago, Lipson and Pollock transferred three different evolved designs, the tetrahedron, the arrow, and the pusher. In 2011, Hiller and Lipson transferred four evolved cantilever beams and the scooting soft robot we saw earlier inside of the vacuum and pressure chamber. Four years later, Cully et al. transferred controllers to 10 different hand-designed morphologies. In a preprint at the end of 2019, Rosser et al. transferred 16 evolved wing designs for ornithopters. And in the work presented here, our rapid construction kit allowed us to transfer 108 designs that were found in simulation. This is an order of magnitude more robots than any other method reported in the literature to date. Our hope is that this open source kit will make designing and building soft robots easy fast, cheap, and safe, and in the process, lower the barrier of entry to soft robotics for non-experts. The design problem is simply to arrange different kinds of building blocks into an aggregate structure, a robot, that performs some desired function. And in this paper, as an example, we considered two very simple building blocks, or voxels. Here's what those voxels look like in simulation, in pairs. And we also set a goal of forward movement, that is net displacement in any direction away from the origin. So with these building blocks and a behavioral goal, we can start to build and test designs in simulation. For example, we might place an active voxel here a passive one next to it in the horizontal plane, two more active voxels on top forming an upright plane, and finally break symmetry with an active limb jutting out perpendicularly from the body. Well, this actually wasn't some random design I just made up. This is the best design according to simulation. Out of every single possible design you can make in this very small workspace of two by two by two uh, coordinates on a Cartesian grid. At every one of those eight spots, there can either be a passive voxel, an active voxel, or nothing. Let's just put this one particular design aside because as there are three options at every single one of the eight coordinates in this workspace, 
there are three to the eight possibilities, or 6,561 possible designs that exist in this design space. We evaluated every single one of them, and here are the top 100 designs according to simulation. And here are those top 100 designs transferred to 100 physical robots composed of hollow silicone voxels that can be pneumatically actuated. This is what those voxels look like in one design as they're expanding and compressing in pressure and thus volume. The first thing we noticed was that expansion was very nice, it's spherical, while compression was much more complex. The voxels buckled. So we sidestepped this by limiting actuation to volumetric expansion only. And in doing so, we're able to transfer our desired behavior, locomotion in any direction. However, if you look closely, you'll see that the simulated and real robots move in the complete opposite direction. So did we really cross the reality gap? Before I discuss the results, let's take a look at how the robots are actually made. The first step is to mix the two base silicone ingredients together with a little colored dye so it's easier to distinguish the active voxels from the passive ones. Now if you have a mixer like this, you can use that to speed up the mixing process, but it isn't strictly necessary. When I make the voxels, I stir them by hand using a popsicle stick. The next step is to pour the uncured mixed silicone into basically an ice cube tray. We supply a blueprint for laser cutting a tray like this one. And you take that ice cube tray, you flip it upside down, so that the silicone can flow out and evenly coat the five walls in each slot as it rotates around a single axis. Let this cure for a few hours, or if you have an incubator, you can use that to expedite the curing process. And then a second layer of silicone is added on top of this base layer in the exact same manner to create double-walled, bottomless cubes. These open-faced silicone cubes are then cut out of the mold, and they're arranged into a layer or slice of the design that was dictated by the computer blueprint. Holes are punched between active voxels in the same slice to allow for a single air inlet per slice. A layer of silicone is prepared, and the slice of voxels is flipped over, open side down, onto the uncured silicone layer, thus creating an entire closed slice of the design. Excess silicone is then trimmed away, and one of the surface voxels in this case, they're all surface voxels, so just one of them is punctured so that an air inlet can be inserted and glued in place to provide external pressure control. Finally, two slices of the design are glued together and simultaneously actuated by a hand pump to produce actuation and movement. These are the quantitative results that we reported in our paper. In summary, the robots that had the highest net displacement in simulation also had the highest net displacement in reality. And the designs that had the least net, net displacement in sim likewise had the least in reality. So thus, in terms of net displacement, these designs transferred to reality. But in terms of direction of movement, the designs did not transfer to reality. As we saw earlier, uh, the behavior of this design in simulation, it's pushing off of its active limb, while in reality it pulls off of its active limb to travel in the opposite direction. Now, this is interesting. The same exact geometry, the same exact controller, 
but different distribution of material properties results in a robot that moves in a different way. This robot pulls with its passive limb in simulation, but pushes with it in reality, again, a mismatch. So to rectify this discrepancy, one thing we came up with was a higher resolution simulated model. Um, this actually did not work, so we ran a grid search for coefficients of static and dynamic friction. That didn't work either. The simulated designs always moved in the wrong direction. The simplest solution might just be to change the friction of the real environment. We don't know. Overall, this work raises more questions than it answers. We think that this is a good thing. And hopefully by introducing this open source modular soft robotics kit, we have lowered the barrier of entry to soft robotics so that these new questions will be addressed by increasingly more researchers and non-experts alike. Thanks to NSF, DARPA, and NASA for supporting this work, and thank you for watching.